So last time, we had a quick look at the bolt side of Vastras theorem and uh, sketched that. I did have a typo, so let me just point that out. So what was the bolt side of Vastras theorem? I'll just remind you, that was, if you take any bounded sequence of, uh, well, if you take any bounded sequence in R to the D, then it has to have at least one convergent subsequence. So even if the sequence diverges by oscillating around somehow, um, or if it's bounded but doesn't converge, that means it will be doing somehow oscillating around all over the place, but it must have at least one convergent subsequence. And in particular, I pointed this out, occurred for this sequence side of n in the real, di real numbers. That was a bounded sequence whose behaviour was a bit peculiar, but uh, in fact it's got lots of different convergent subsequences. So I started to sketch the proof using repeated bisection of intervals and repeated quadrisection of rectangles and so on. And uh, all was going quite well. And then, uh, then I called, I took this interval which had the whole sequence in, A1 and B1, and I called the midpoint C1. And then somewhere along the line, it suddenly became C. Well, if you're going to write the proof out in full, it's better to keep it as a C1, because when you get to the next interval, you'll call it the midpoint C2 and so on. So probably better to call it C1 and then C2 if you're going to carry on with the proof. Anyway, enough of that. <coughs> so then we moved on to sequential compactness. I gave you the definition, which has a subtlety in it, because it's not just saying that every sequence in your set E has a convergent subsequence, because that would just mean that E had to be bounded. No, it's saying that every sequence in E has to have a convergent subsequence which converges to a point of E. So that's saying a bit more. Whatever sequence you take in E, at least one of its subsequences must converge to a point of E. And that's what the definition of sequentially compact is. And that definition applies in more generality any time that you've got a set with a notion of distance. And so you can talk about that in the setting of metric spaces that um, you're meeting metric and topological spaces if you do that in third year. However, if you're working in R to the D, there's this very handy characterization of when you're sequentially compact. And the answer is, from the heider borel theorem, the sequential compactness version of that, there's lots of different heider borel theorems. This is the sequential compactness one. It says that a subset of R to the D is sequentially compact if and only if it's both closed and bounded. And I gave you some illustrative examples last time of sequences that did strange things, like um, we had a sequence in a set that escaped from a set um, at the limit. We had um, a bounded set and a sequence, again, which, which gave problems because the set wasn't closed. And we had a closed set, namely the real line, that gave problems because the set wasn't bounded. So there really are you really are going to leave both closed and bounded to make this work. And so our task now is to prove the heider borel theorem that uh, E is sequentially compact if and only if E is closed and bounded. As I pointed out, one way round is easier than the other. So uh, two implies one is relatively easy, and one implies two is a bit harder. Um, hold on, let me just remind myself again which is which. One is sequentially compact, two is closed and bounded. So we're given E is a subset of R to the D to start with. And that's 
E is going to be fixed throughout the proof, but we're going to make various different assumptions about it. And we're going to do two implies one. <coughs> so suppose that E is closed and bounded. Well, we're supposed to prove that E is sequentially compact. The definition of sequentially compact is for every sequence in E, something happens. So the first line of our proof should either be let or suppose um, that Xn is a sequence in E. Since E might be empty, and that is actually valid, if E is empty, you could treat it as a special case, or we could get around the whole thing by saying suppose that Xn is a sequence in E, and that will be a valid proof about all sequences. So this is our typical first line of a proof. Our first line of a proof of, for all sequences is, suppose that Xn is a sequence in E. Now, if we can prove that that has a subsequence converging to a point in E, we'll have proven that that works for every sequence in E, and that will show that E is sequentially compact. So we have to prove, un just under these assumptions, that Xn must have a convergent subsequence which converges to a point in E. <coughs> At least one such. Well, first is to get that it's got some sort of convergent subsequence at all, and that's because E is bounded. So that makes this sequence bounded. If you have a sequence in a bounded set, then the sequence is definitely a bounded sequence. That's uh, <coughs> trivial. Now we can quote Baltzana Weierstrass to say that this sequence has at least one subsequence that converges in R to the D. So now we're quoting a previous result. Now, so far, we don't know whether the limit's in E, but we'll deal with that in a minute. So let's say, say xkn tends to x in R to the D as n tends to infinity. Now, I didn't bother saying that k1 was less than k2 was less than k3 and so on. This is, by this stage, understood. But if you wanted to be really careful, you would say there are a k1 less than k2 less than k3 and so on, giving you this subsequence. But by now, by, because I said it's a convergent subsequence, it's understood what notation I'm using. If you've got any questions about that or, or worries about that, you could always add in the extra bit if you want, saying where we understand that k1 is less than k2 is less than k3 and so on. We've picked out a subsequence converging to something in R to the D. Yes, but we're supposed to get a subsequence converging to something in E. So how do we know for, how do we know this subsequence is OK, for example? What is it that makes us know that we're already finished, that we don't have to do any more work? How do we know that X has got to be in E as well? Any suggestions? We have to use everything we know about the set E. We've used the fact that E is bounded, so there's only one more piece of information available. What else do we know about the set E? Uh, 
Yes? So we assume that E was closed and bounded. We've used the fact it's bounded. If we don't use the fact that it's closed somewhere in the proof, then we've cheated. Um, so we have to use the fact that it's closed. Uh, this is a good place to use it. Um, if you've got a sequence in a closed set and the sequence converges to something, then by the sequence criterion for closeness, that limit must be in the set as well. Now, so since xkn is also a sequence in E, and E is closed, by the sequence criterion for closeness, x, which is this limit of this sequence in E, is also in E. Um, so this shows, so xn does have a subsequence converging to a point, namely x in E. And, rem so, and now we know we've done this bit of the proof because we took an arbitrary sequence in E and we've shown that it has a subsequence converging to a point of E, so that shows that it's true for all such sequences, and we've finished. <coughs> this proves the implication uh, 2 implies 1. To finish the proof, we're going to do not two implies not one. <coughs> okay. That means we've got to successfully negate 2. So here's a little optional extra. We do need to <coughs> negate 2 correctly. Two says E is closed and bounded. E is closed and E is bounded. I shall make it easier to negate slightly. Ah, come back. <coughs> Run out of room again. <coughs> so we've got to negate it correctly. If we negate it, if we get this wrong, then uh, we'll be cheating. So not to says, so what happens if you negate E is closed and bounded, or E is closed and E is bounded, which is the same thing? What should I put here? It's, it's quite easy to get it wrong. Yeah? Oh, I could, sorry, yeah, this is all, this is all, um, the problem here is that I haven't put the screen down. That's not the only problem. We could do with having these lights off as well. Yes, I'll go back up, sorry about that. So, uh, so yes, if, uh, if there is a problem like that, and uh, I've clearly forgotten to do something useful, 
I'm, I'm perfectly happy for you to, uh, to point it out. <laughs> Can you read this okay now? So we've got to negate this correctly, and we're trying to, uh, e, we've got E is closed and E is bounded, and we're trying to negate that. <coughs> so has anybody worked out yet? Yeah? E is not closed or E is not bounded. That's exactly right. You have to avoid all the traps. E is not closed, or E is not bounded. So armed with the fact that we can negate correctly, we have to use our correct negation. So we suppose that 2 is false. Then E is not closed or E is not bounded. Either of those could happen. So there's two cases. Case one, E is not closed. Then by the sequence criterion for closeness, we can find a sequence in E that converges to something that's outside E. So we can use the sequence criterion for closeness. It characterizes when it's closed, and it fails if you're not closed. So if you're not closed, you can escape from E by taking the limit of a sequence in E. So by the sequence criterion for closeness, <coughs> there is a sequence, X head in E, which converges in R to the D to some point outside E, which we'll call X. So if you use the fact it's not closed, we've applied the sequence criteria for closeness, that gives you that there exists a sequence doing something nasty. And that sequence is also going to prevent it being sequentially compact. But then, every subsequence of Xn also converges to X. And as a result, by the uniqueness of limits in R to the D, no subsequence of this sequence can converge to a point of E. Because they're all converging to a point outside E, so none of them can converge to a point inside E. Obviously, quite a lot of sequences and subsequences don't converge to anything at all. But if they do converge to something, 
if, if some subsequence of this sequence x here converges to something, well, it's converging to x. In, oh, sorry, this sequence x here we already knew converged to x, but uh, in general, if you took a sequence in E, it wouldn't have to converge to anything at all. But one thing is for sure, every subsequence of this sequence is, is converging to this point that's outside E, and that gives you trouble. So that sequence XZ is a bad sequence from the point of view of sequential compactness because no subsequence of it converges to anything in E. So that shows that in this case, that in case one, <coughs> E is not sequentially compact. <coughs> and that leaves us case two. So if case one doesn't hold, we're in case two. <coughs> case two is that E is not bounded. Now, there's a question sheet question that gives you a very useful characterization of that, which I'll just quote for you. But it's, it's based on the usual idea um, about for all r greater than naught, something happens. Uh, I won't go through the full bit of that now. We'll, I'll just quote this result. Um, in this case, you can quote this standard result. And if you haven't checked this exercise for yourself, it's worth doing. There's a sequence xn in E such that for every natural number n, the norm of xn is at least n. In fact, I'll go for greater than n because that work, that's just as good. <laughs> I'll just tell you where that comes from, in case you didn't ever check that exercise. If you're bounded, then you're contained in some b big ball centers on the origin. If you're not bounded, then whatever big ball you try, you're not contained in that. In particular, you could take the ball with radius little n. If you take the closed ball on the origin with radius little n, and you know you're not in there, then there has to be at least one point of the set outside. That tells you there's at least one point of the set whose norm is bigger than little n. And we just call that xn. But because that's already on a question sheet, we don't have to write that all down here. You can quote that if you're unbounded, then you can do this. In the past, I have included the full details at this point, but I'm, I'm going to make the proof slightly shorter by just quoting this result. Full details are available in the solutions to that question sheet or on request. Right, so I claim that again, this is a bad sequence from the point of view of sequential compactness. So what happens then? Every subsequence of Xn. So every subsequence xkn of xn also has norms tending to infinity, at least as fast. The bound, uh, but convergent sequences don't do that. So, no such subsequence can converge 
I'll just give you a little optional extra on that one. For example, um, we know that convergent sequences have to be bounded. Lots of other ways to finish that off if you really wanted to put the extra detail in. And so again, we found a bad sequence with no convergent subsequence, and that shows that E is, is not sequentially compact. Um, that we only had two cases, case one and case two. In either case, let's say in this case either, And we only had uh, one of those two cases has to happen, so we finished the proof. <coughs> Thus, uh, one is false. We, proved, we finally proved that not two implies not one, and we've finished the whole thing. Any questions about that proof? <coughs> Probably one of the longest proofs we've had so far. And we used pretty much everything we've done before. We've built up some theory. This is one of the things we, I was talking about in the sessions on how do we do proofs. We've built up some theory to get to this point. We understand closed sets quite well. We understand bounded sets quite well. Um, we know a bit about sequences and subsequences. That proof puts together just about every fact that's been dealt with, apart from not saying anything really about open sets, it puts together just about everything we've looked at from the module before. So if you could really understand that proof, it involves really understanding everything that's gone before as well. All uh, right, so... Now we can say lots of sets are sequentially compact because we know that they're closed and bounded. Uh, intervals. I guess I mean closed, bounded D, uh, D cells in R to the D is a bit more general. And these closed intervals, I mean the bounded closed intervals, of course. However, when people talk about closed intervals, they almost always mean intervals A, B, bounded closed intervals in the real line. You don't normally get people talking about closed intervals of these strange unbounded intervals in the real line that happen to be closed sets. There are some strange unbounded intervals in the real line that happen to be closed sets, and you have to watch out for those. But that's not normally what people mean by closed interval. So closed and bounded D cells are closed and bounded, and so they're sequentially compact. So for one, typical, you take a, a nice closed rectangle. Here's a closed two cell in R squared. Maybe it's AB cross CD. <coughs> it's closed and it's bounded, so it's sequentially compact. By the Heine Borel theorem. This set is sequentially compact. 
Um, and the same goes for uh, clothed balls for the same reason. We know that closed balls in R to D are bounded sets. They're closed sets. So they're closed and bounded, and therefore they're sequentially compact. This set two is a bit less obvious, though. The thing about this set two is that uh, it's easier to see it's bounded because, in fact, everything... there. They're real numbers, and they're all between 0 and 1. So it's definitely bounded. And the question is, why is it closed? Actually, it's a, a little bit tricky to check it's closed, but I think the easiest way to check it's closed is to, is to look at the complement and show it's made up of some open intervals. So, so for 2... You take E equals 0 together with, and the second bit of that set was 1, a half, a third, a quarter, and so on. And if you sketch that on the real line, so where are your points? Um, here's naught. Oh, that's not what I wanted. There's naught, there's one. But then you've also got a half, a third, a quarter, and so on. You've got this sequence of points coming in. Well, there are various ways to prove that E is closed. You could try using the sequence criterion, but that gets a bit confusing because it's sort of a sequence in a sequence. You can argue it that way, and if you do it carefully, you can prove that every <coughs> sequence here that converges, well, because your ad repeats, it could be that it converges to one of these points away from the origin. If it doesn't have lots and lots of repeats in, and it converges, the only way it can do it is by turning to zero, um, which you can also do with lots of repeats of zero. So it's a, a little bit confusing to use the sequence criteria to prove closeness. I think that the easiest way to see that it's closed is to look at the complement, which is made up of lots of open bits. But you have to think quite hard to figure out exactly what the complement is. But it's made up of, of a union of a sequence of open bits. Um, open intervals, including two unbounded ones. So there are two unbounded open intervals here, and then a sequence of other bounded open intervals, and that's what the complement is. So E complement is open, and E is closed. an exercise to check the details. <coughs> uh, points of E are marked with crosses. Right. Any questions about any of those examples or about the theory we've been talking about so far? OK, let's finish off the chapter. So why is sequential compact so nice? Well, 
one of the reasons secretionally compact is so nice is what we're going to see a bit later, um, that the, the fact you knew about continuous functions on closed and bounded intervals from the real line, the boundedness theorem for continuous functions on closed intervals, works for continuous functions defined on sequentially compact sets. So it gives you this really good generalization of the boundedness theorem. But actually, you can generalize this further using a more advanced condition which you meet in metric and topological spaces in third year called just compactness. Compactness involves coverings by open sets and saying, well, you only need finitely many. It's actually quite a tricky condition to understand, and we won't deal with it in this module. If you're interested, you can find out about compactness already um, in any of the recommended books for metric and topological spaces. I particularly recommend the book by Sutherland, um, excellent book. Um, so if you're interested, the book, book of Sutherland, I think it's W. Sutherland, is highly recommended. if you're interested in that stuff. And uh, that brings us to the end of that chapter. So I'll just pause the recording there and start a fresh recording for the next chapter.